Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat here? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us begin in song. I was there to hear your warning cry. I'll be there when you are home. I was there the day you were baptized to watch your life That God called you into this world, God is there throughout your existence, and that God will call you from this life to himself. Now everybody likes that first part, they don't like that last part, but you should. When there is no pain or no more sorrow, you'll be reunited and celebrated in the presence of God. But that's where doubts come in, right? <laughs> the doubting that overtakes our faith and causes us to question Jesus altogether. No doubts. That is the name of the sermon today, No Doubts. I want you to put away your doubt and have faith. Always. Not just today. Always. And I recognize it's difficult. I recognize it's a struggle. And I recognize that some people will fall short. I was away last week and I had an opportunity to be with my father. And during that time, we got a chance to watch the Game Show Network. <laughs> yep, the Game Show Network. <laughs> and we watched a show called Deal or No Deal. How many of you don't know what this show is about? Okay, we have a couple of people, so I'll give you the gist as quickly as possible. Howie Mandel, the comedian, calls out these 26 ladies. They come out with briefcases and they stand in lines. And they, within their briefcase, have a figure written out from one cent to a million dollars. The contestant chooses one of the cases, they bring it down to the person, and then they call out random numbers until, you know, uh, they get down to the lowest number. And there's a guy, 
the banker, who will give them a quote, a will give you this for that case, an amount of money, based on the numbers that still exist on the board. If you're confused, watch the show and you go, I got it. Okay? So, this was a special show. Not one million dollar case, but eight were in the 27 or 30, you know, cases. Okay? So this woman came out and said, number 17 has a million dollars in it. So they brought her the case number 17. So she went through the whole gyration, calling out numbers and all of those things. In the first six, she called out four of the million dollar cases. So she was kind of saddened. Anyway, she was adamant that she had a million dollars in that case. Adamant. So she got down to the last five cases. One had a million dollars in it, and the other four had 5,000 and less. So the banker said to her, I'll give you $100,000 for your case. And she said, no, I have the million dollars in my case. But her family stood beside her saying, Take the deal. Take the deal. And then, of course, they went to commercial. They came back, and Howie said, hey, there's a 20% chance that that case has a million dollars that you have. But there's an 80% chance that it's not there. So she pondered it and she said, no, I have a million dollars here. And her family was after her. So she said, ah, okay, deal, deal. Howie came out as he does and he says, okay, what was the next number you were gonna call? And he says, she said the number, the opening is one cent. And then he said, you know, if you would have waited, we would have offered you $250,000. What's the next number you want? She called another number, and a number came up, and she said, we would have given you $400,000 if you would have done this. The next number she called, we would have offered you half a million dollars. And now he said, it's time to open your case to see if you made a good deal. She opened her case, a million dollars. Why did she doubt? Why did she have questions? Why was she so ready to make a deal? And that is the question for the people of God gathered here to the world. Why does doubt overtake us? Is it because of our friends? Is it because of family? Is it because of those people who are acquaintances who come up and say, why do you believe? And you're so concerned that you don't say anything. And you start to doubt your resolve. Doubt Jesus. And then we come to the gospel for today. Jesus comes among his people and doubts arise in their hearts. Doubts arise in their hearts. So Jesus says, touch him. Jesus shows him his hands and his feet. Jesus eats them. And you know, at the end of this, they were still doubting. What does it take to convince you? 
What does it take? Are you like Thomas? Unless I put my hands and touch his side and, and do all of this, will I believe? Or does it take more? Are you like Gideon? Hey, make the fleece wet, make it dry, make it something so I will believe. I have to have something tangible so I won't doubt. This is a struggle in the Christian church, and I can see it, of course, in the numbers of people who attend worship. Our numbers have been declining since the 50s, and there's a reason. Doubt. Doubt. There was an evangelist in Denver. This happened a long time ago. But I love sharing the story. His car broke down, and he was doing some, like, Billy Graham crusades, but it wasn't Billy Graham. Anyway, he was doing a crusade in Denver, and his car broke down. This was the third of his five nights in the city. So he got on a bus. He got on a bus. And back then you gave money, you didn't have a ticket or a car or anything, you gave money. So he gave money to the guy, and the bus driver gave him his change, but he gave him 25 cents more than he should have received. So the evangelist is looking through what he received, and he said, the guy gave me 25 cents more. And then he thought to himself, it's only 25 cents. Who cares about 25 cents? Who cares about 25 cents, right? But he turned around and he walked back to the bus driver and he said, I'm sorry you gave me too much money. Here's 25 cents. And the bus driver said, I know I did. I know I gave you 25 cents more. I was at the revival last night, and I heard you say, the little things matter. And I doubted you. And I doubted you. And so on. Why do people doubt you? Do you say things and not do them? Do you proclaim the gospel and live a life that is contrary to that vision? When doubts arise, do you celebrate? Or are you standing firm in what Christ has done for you in his dying and his rising? Jesus does all of these things so the people will hear the message. He shows them, touch me, let me eat, let me show you my hands, my wounds, so that you can hear the message again. I want you to hear the message again with power, so that you will open your hearts and your minds, put away your doubts, and step out of here and share the gospel with everyone you meet. Caring, loving, sharing, rejoicing that God has been with you from the beginning. No doubt. No doubt. I was getting my deep water certificate in my scuba diving time in my life. Any scuba divers? We have one. So scuba diving is interesting and I'll give you some clarity. Um, in Hollywood you see people scuba diving and they see a big shark and they start swimming towards the uh, surface. I asked, well those all people would die because 
the nitrogen in your brain builds up, and if you beat your bubbles to the surface, not good for you. Okay? So, deep water means I went 150, 200 feet down in the water. I was in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Turkey. I was briefed by my instructor how it was going to go. We started down into the depths. About 50 feet, it started getting darker, grayer, and after that, it was just dark. The only reason I know how deep I was is I had a watch that told me how deep I was, and it was illuminated. Okay? So I got to the depth, 150, 200 feet. We were at the bottom. And he took this uh, flare, I guess, underwater flare, and he popped it. And I saw a huge fish, no shark, huge fish. But I saw the colors at the bottom of the ocean, they were vibrant. Though they were clouded in darkness before that, now I could see. Now I was, wow, this is amazing. This is a celebration of color of majesty, of beauty. And after that, it was over. It was time to go up. It was time to resurface. As I was resurfacing, I got something that's called nitrogen narcosis. The nitrogen in your brain causes you to think wrong thoughts, to do wrong things. So, I started having a conversation with myself, much like the devil and the angel on your shoulder, you know what I'm talking about? Anyway, the one voice was saying, you're gonna die. You need to get to the surface. You're gonna die. And the other voice was, relax, you're fine. Relax, you're fine. Well, the one voice overwhelmed the other, and I started swimming for the surface, passing my bubbles. Bad. Scott shaking his head, bad. My instructor grabbed me to stop my progression to the surface. Grabbed me, literally. And I started fighting him because this doubt had overcome my senses. This doubt that I was going to survive overwhelmed me altogether. But after I gained a little towards the surface, my mind came back. My instructor let me go. And he you know, we didn't have the microphones at the time. He said, kind of saying, are you okay now? And I gave him the thumbs up, because he, now he's shining a light on me. I gave him the thumbs up, and then he did this. <laughs> <laughs> the universal sign, you're crazy, right? <laughs> Once we got to the top, after spending, we descended. We swam around a little bit more than we would have. We got to the surface, and I thanked him for stopping us. I thanked him for saving my life. Brothers and sisters, sometimes Easter is overshadowed by following Easter. We forget the beauty of it. The lilies, the beauty of the people, the numbers of people who come. And then it returns somehow to darkness. And then those doubts come back to us. Those doubts that cause us to question our faith. Jesus comes to embrace you. And call you again to that Easter morning of beauty and celebration. He comes 
and he will let you go. But he will not leave your side. He will let you do foolish things. He will let you be doubtful. He comes to show you today in this sermon his love, his hope, his grace. I pray that you will see the beauty. Rejoice in the promise. And go from this place proclaiming the gospel, the good news, so that others might put away their doubts and have faith. And all God's children said,